Winston Churchill said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Learning from past crises and disasters is essential for improving future crisis and disaster planning. But learning can be challenging and requires reflection to identify what could be improved. Recording and sharing these lessons can help tourism operators become more resilient to crises and disasters. The best time for learning and reflection is after a crisis or disaster is resolved. Learning and reflection should also occur across tourism sectors to improve planning for the whole destination, not just individual operators. This generates two key questions. One, how should learning from tourism crises and disasters best occur? And two, what are effective ways to collect and share knowledge, especially across industry sectors? To answer these questions, it is important to first understand what knowledge is. Knowledge is different from information. Information is just facts and data. Knowledge is what you get when you combine information with experience or education. Knowledge generates insights and a deeper understanding of a subject, which can then be applied to solve a problem. In our case, this knowledge can be used to improve crisis and disaster planning. Two types of knowledge exist, explicit and tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is knowledge that can be captured and transmitted to others through objects such as reports, presentations, manuals and guidelines. Tacit knowledge is knowledge associated with skills, ideas and experiences. It is difficult to communicate to others because it's in your mind and may not be easily expressed. It cannot be easily captured in a knowledge object. The challenge is to make tacit knowledge explicit so it can be shared and used by others. This is difficult as personal beliefs and thoughts are hard to capture. So how should learning from tourism crises and disasters best occur? Researchers suggest reflection is needed at the end of a crisis or disaster to enable new knowledge to be created to improve crisis planning. They propose six interrelated actions for managed reflection. Points one and two are about asking questions and reflecting on what worked. Key questions need to be asked about alternative strategies and options. Were the strategies used to recover from the crisis the right ones? Did they actually work? For instance, were the crisis communication messages consistent and timely? Were other messages perhaps better? Could the response have been faster? Did the tourism industry work well with government to respond to the disaster? Could it have done more? Third, in the absence of information on a crisis or disaster, assumptions are often made about their predicted tourism impacts. These assumptions influence decisions. Challenging these initial assumptions and beliefs is not easy, but are important to generate knowledge. For instance, did the crisis actually have a negative impact on tourist markets, as assumed? Was the impact as long as initially assumed? Were these assumptions correct, and how did they influence decisions? Fourth, dialogue with other stakeholders on crisis response strategies and their effectiveness is important. For instance, involving others in workshops and interviews can gather a range of views and opinions and help generate new knowledge and insights about what worked and what did not work. Dialogue with the tourism industry was vital after the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak and helped to develop better response strategies. Fifth, sometimes decisions are made with limited data and information. Did the media respond positively to any public relations activities? How did target markets respond to crisis marketing? Collecting data can help identify whether media coverage improved. It can also show whether consumers saw recovery marketing and if it encouraged them to visit after a crisis. Finally, action planning and implementation of new plans or changes to existing plans are an important final step. Why generate new knowledge if it's not going to be used to improve future plans? Now let's consider our second question. What are effective ways to collect and share knowledge, especially across industry sectors? First, knowledge needs to be captured before it can be used. 
technology can be used to capture and share knowledge. Policies, procedures, manuals, templates and information systems are some useful examples. They can help make tacit knowledge more explicit. Although such an approach may be helpful, a people-led strategy may be more effective for tourism. This is because tourism is a people-based industry. Talking to people, sharing insights and building dialogue may be more useful to collect and share knowledge. Here's an example to illustrate my point. Research by the University of Queensland found that accommodation businesses, crisis and disaster planning was poor. It was much better for larger businesses that have been operating for more than 30 years. The research found that planning can be improved based on three key factors. First, if managers felt pressure from other people, both within and outside their organisation, they were more likely to plan for crises and disasters. So peer pressure was important. Second, managers need to change their negative attitudes about crisis planning and think more positively. Those who saw it as worthwhile and useful were more likely to plan for crises. They also felt more prepared to manage crises and disasters when they occur. Finally, managers were more likely to plan if they had experienced a previous crisis or disaster. The research suggests that sharing experiences of businesses that have been through a crisis or disaster may be more effective than reading a manual or a report. A people-led approach might work best for tourism businesses. Peer pressure can be used to change negative attitudes and encourage crisis planning. Now let's hear from tourism operators whose businesses have been impacted by crises and disasters in the past. What lessons did the businesses learn and what changes and improvements did they make as a result? So what were the key lessons that I learned from the disaster, the flood? Uh, there are a number actually. I think uh, firstly and most importantly, I think uh, the ability to be able to change the nature of your business as visitation and, and new customers' way of interacting with you is, is slightly different. So for instance, um, the one thing we had to identify was who are still our, our customers and why were they coming down? And I think keeping that uh, small nature about your business and being able to pivot as you need to was very, very important. Even to this day when I make decisions, I start thinking about, well, what if the market changes somewhat? How am I going to react to that? And are my people skilled enough to be able to move as I need them to move? So that was, in fact, my most in important learning. Secondly, the importance of having the community on board. Uh, there was nothing better than that feeling of everyone turning up here to help. So, so when you make decisions sometimes, it's really, really important to make sure that your local community and your support base are also on board with the decisions you make. Did we ever get the team together and talk about what happened and then find learnings from that? Yeah, we did. We did that for probably six weeks straight. We had two or three meetings a week and we got together and we talked about what happened, uh, what's going to happen again. We went through everything from insurance requirements to the type of vessels we use, um, what we need to do in preparation for an event like this again. We were very, very fortunate that we already had a lot of things in place. For instance, um, we had systems in place for when the water comes in that we can quickly dismantle barriers so that the water doesn't have the impact and drags all our equipment away. So we, we were very fortunate from the start. But the, the staff were very worried, you know, because um, we did see a downturn in visitation and that was concerning. So, so we also talked about what new products can we bring forward, how can we get people down here, and all of those sort of things which were really important to keeping the staff happy, uh, feel secure about their jobs and feel secure about our business. So were there any real positives that came out of the disaster? Yes, indeed. You know, we're, we're certainly not the same organisation now that we were prior to the floods. Uh, for me, the biggest positives were our new structure and the fact that we really, really now know that you know, digital marketing, branding, 
communication, uh, marketing, it's all very, very important and it really needs to be done in-house. Uh, we find that uh, doing things in-house means that you can react very, very quickly to opportunities and there are a lot of opportunities that come up all the time and um, that was, for me, was the biggest positive out of the floods. It's strange, but in, in, in some way, the fire drew lots of attention to our area. Uh, and the figures, the, the, the tourism figures in the 12 months after the fire, it was one of the better years we'd ever had. So I don't think we can, we can't dine out on that, but uh, there's certainly still a, a lot of goodwill out there to the plight of plight of our town, so that's why we're looking to build a rebuild the Walt Singh Matilda Centre and get it opened as soon as we can. I think the fires taught taught us lots of lessons. The building wasn't that old; it was a little under 20 years, but there were no firewalls, and it must have been the law then. You didn't have to have firewalls. There were no sprinkler systems, so the new the new architects and the new design certainly embraces all of those things um, and I, I think with the with the digital world uh, maybe some of the treasures will be locked up in a very safe place and digital reproductions of them uh, and the other thing with uh, we're hoping and we're planning to have a lot of virtual reality so maybe we'll use some of those treasures but in a in a virtual reality sense I, I think what happened with the Walsing Matilda Centre has forced us into really making a quantum leap forward in, in what we do in tourism. It's very easy to get stuck how you've done stuff. You know, it's 2000 and almost 2017, so how we did things back in 1980 is not appropriate anymore. And, uh, you know, tourism is working towards that, but we've been forced uh, into changing our ways in a big way, you know, not not just rearranging the deck chairs. You know, we want to steer the ship in a, in a different direction. And uh, one of the good things that's come out of the fire is that it's forced forced tourism in, in Winton and the council to make those make those changes to uh, enter into this brave new world. In infrastructure for tourism back in the late 80s around the bicentenary, and uh, lots of lots of those places were 20. 25 years old and uh, we certainly need to do a refurbishment on the Walsing Matilda Centre. I don't think we'd plan to do a major refurbishment like a rebuild but uh, in some ways, like it's tragic that it burnt because we did lose a fair bit of stuff but uh, in some ways it's forced, forced our hand to, to rebuild and make it bigger and better. We have highlighted the importance of knowledge generation and sharing but which organisations are best placed to encourage knowledge generation and sharing? Research suggests that destination marketing organisations, DMOs, and industry associations can play an important role. They can help operators to make knowledge explicit and transfer knowledge across sectors. A good example is Tourism and Events Queensland in Queensland, Australia, the state DMO. They've developed a series of video interviews with operators who have experienced crises and disasters. Here operators reflect on their experiences, identify lessons learnt and outline what improvements they have made. Their videos are on YouTube and range from 5 to 10 minutes in length. This shows how the DMO can make operators tacit knowledge more explicit and how this knowledge can be shared using video technologies. Learning from past crises and disasters is important. It enables improvements to strategies and helps build resilience for future crises and disasters. The six questions outlined earlier can facilitate managed reflection to make knowledge explicit. Knowledge also needs to be stored so that it can be accessed and used to make improvements. The DMO or industry associations have a role to play to translate knowledge and share it across the industry in appropriate formats, such as video. So we should learn from history or risk repeating the same mistakes.